Silver or mercury, which was used in the hat trade with disastrous consequences for workers' health. This was well known. That's why we still say mad as a hatter. <laughs> it's 1812. Dental amalgam has just been invented, and you have a toothache. Progress hasn't caught up with your corner of the world. You're going to go to the local barber. Surgeon? Dentist? There's no anaesthetics. If you're lucky, you might get a shot of whiskey. He scrapes out the decay from your tooth. And heats up the lead. You can understand why silver amalgam seemed like such a good idea at the time. It was cheap, easy to use, and it set hard. It was definitely an improvement over molten lead, which, after all, is the second most toxic substance known to science. Mercury is the third most toxic substance known to science. Removal of dental amalgam is hazardous. Strict protocols must be applied for the safety of the patients and the dental personnel. This film does not constitute medical advice. Always read the manufacturer's instructions. Always consult your healthcare practitioner, but choose carefully. <laughs> By the 1830s, use of dental amalgam had spread through Europe and the Americas. It seemed like progress. Dentists who used this new wonder material were called Quecksilver dentists, or quacks for short. The use of dental amalgam was vigorously opposed by the dental societies of the time because of its mercury content. Dental societies required their members to sign a pledge that they would never place this toxic material in a person's mouth. The quacks refused. There was major controversy and the existing dental societies in the USA and Sweden collapsed. New dental associations were formed by the quacks based on the use of dental amalgam as the best restorative for filling human teeth. These same associations still set the standards today. So what is dental amalgam? Amalgam, a mixture of one or more metals with mercury. The metal in this case is an alloy of roughly 40% silver, 30% tin, 28% copper and 2% zinc. The alloy is ground into a fine powder. That powder is then added to an equal amount of liquid mercury and mixed in the surgery to create a dental amalgam filling. Some of the mercury bonds with the surface of the alloy particles. The remaining free mercury escapes continually from the set material. It's a bit like bricks and mortar, where the bricks are the alloy and the mortar is the mercury. The mortar, the mercury, binds with the bricks, the alloy, at the surfaces. There is always free mercury remaining behind the surfaces, between the particles. That first filling is a critical step in the life of a tooth. Using amalgam for the first filling requires removing a lot of the tooth substance. Not only diseased tooth substance, but healthy tooth substance as well. So in making the undercut, you sacrifice a lot and this results in a weakened tooth. In 1997, Cork Company, the manufacturers of dispersaloy, stated that their amalgam should not be used in the following situations. In proximal or occlusal contact to dissimilar metal restorations, in patients with severe renal deficiency, in patients with known allergies to amalgam, 
for retrograde or endodontic filling as a filling material for a cast crown in children six and under and in expectant mothers. Symptoms of chronic long-term low-level exposure to mercury vapour. Inhalation of mercury vapour over a long period may cause mercurialism, which is characterised by fine tremors and erythism. Tremors may affect the hands first, but may also become evident in the face, arms and legs. Erythism may be manifested by abnormal shyness, blushing, self-consciousness, depression or despondency, resentment of criticism, irritability or excitability headache, fatigue and insomnia. In severe cases, hallucinations, loss of memory and mental deterioration may occur. Concentrations as low as 0.03 micrograms per cubic metre have induced psychiatric symptoms in humans. Renal involvement may be indicated by proteinuria, albuminuria, enzymuria and anuria. Other effects may include salivation, gingivitis, stomatitis, loosening of the teeth, blue lines on the gums, diarrhoea, chronic pneumonitis and mild anemia. Repeated exposure to mercury and its compounds may result in sensitisation. Intrauterine exposure may result in tremors and involuntary movement in infants. Mercury is excreted in breast milk. Paternal reproductive effects and effects on fertility have been reported in male rats following repeated inhalation exposures. The material safety data sheet for Titan, manufactured by Kerkorp, states the placement of a dental amalgam in a patient will increase the levels of mercury in the body of the patient. Filling is built up in increments. It is overfilled so that the surface layer, which is rich in free metallic mercury, can be carved off. It's assumed that carving an amalgam will remove all of the mercury-rich layer. This is not the case. The health authorities of the various countries, including Canada, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Norway and Austria, have recommended against the placement or removal of amalgam in certain individuals, such as pregnant and nursing women and persons with impaired kidney function. The material safety data sheet for Ivo Class Vivident states, the product must not enter effluent, groundwater, surface water or the soil. Dental offices contribute between 12,000 and 50,000 pounds of mercury to wastewater each year in the United States. The American Dental Association have stated that the strongest and most convincing support we have for the safety of dental amalgam is the fact that each year more than 1,100 million amalgam fillings are placed in the United States. Let's look at those figures for a moment. Each one of these fillings weighs about a gram. Half of that is mercury. If we consider people to be part of the environment, then that means 550 tonnes of mercury is being placed in the environment in the USA each year alone and not subject to any hazardous waste protocols. All of these fillings leach mercury all the time. Most of that mercury stays in the body, where it is a cumulative toxin. What happens to all that mercury every year when people die? The only place dental amalgam is not regarded as toxic waste is in a living human mouth. All mercury silver fillings leak substantial amounts of mercury constantly. The amount increases with any kind of stimulation and as a result mercury from fillings produces the majority of human exposure to mercury. The International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology is extremely concerned about the anecdotal claims of safety by manufacturers and dental trade associations. They're at variance with the published, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to the contrary. This is mercury coming off a filling that was dipped in water 
that's the same temperature as the human body. This is a filling that was rubbed with a pencil eraser for just a few seconds. Like going to the hygienist and having her clean your teeth. In 1989, in a memorandum to all members, the Australian Dental Association stated, mercury can be released from amalgam restorations either in the form of mercury vapour or mercuric ions. Mercury combines with oxygen to form mercuric and mercurous oxides, both of which are highly poisonous. The US Occupational Safety and Health Authority sets a maximum allowable mercury vapour concentration for a 40 hour per week occupational exposure at a time weighted average of 50 micrograms of mercury per cubic metre. The United States Environmental Protection Agency regulates for everyone else, especially pregnant women and children. Their maximum allowable mercury vapour concentration is 0.3 micrograms of mercury per cubic metre. The US Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry states that a transient exposure to levels of mercury vapour as low as 0.02 micrograms of mercury per cubic metre is considered acute, immediately hazardous to health. Criteria 118, published by the World Health Organization in 1991, reports on dietary exposure to mercury. This was the first time that mercury from dental amalgam had been included as a dietary source of mercury. Air and water, negligible amounts. Other food, 0.3 micrograms per day of inorganic mercury. Fish and seafood, 2.3 micrograms per day of methyl mercury. Dental amalgam, 3 to 17 micrograms per day of mercury vapour. Their results indicate that dental amalgam provides a dietary source of mercury up to six times greater than all other sources combined, including seafood. A more recent study indicates that two-thirds of the mercury in the bodies of humans with amalgam fillings comes from the fillings. The tolerable daily intake, TDI, is the amount of a substance which most people in the population are able to cope with. It is not a safe level. In 1995, research commissioned by Health Canada was published. This was the first time mercury from dental amalgam was considered in an official risk assessment study. It sent shockwaves through the dental establishment. It found that the tolerable daily intake was exceeded in the case of adults with four or more amalgam fillings. For teens, this figure drops to three. Children and toddlers can have only one amalgam filling before being exposed to levels of mercury above the TDI set out by the US and Canadian governments. This led Health Canada to issue new recommendations to dentists. Amalgam should not be placed in pregnant women, in people with kidney dysfunction and should not be used in children. Dentists should acknowledge the patient's right to decline treatment with any dental material. Is the mercury which is released from fillings absorbed into the body? Yes, but in extremely small amounts, that is, in millionths of a gram. This is a very small amount. Point naught, 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 one grams. Health Canada responded publicly to this material from the Canadian Dental Association. This answer is rather condescending and insulting to the intelligence of readers. By emphasising only how small a microgram is, it implies that a microgram of toxic material could not be harmful. What is significant is not how many zeros there are in a microgram, but how many micrograms of mercury are released by amalgam compared to the number of micrograms required to cause illness. The fact is that a level of only 100 millionths of a gram of mercury per gram of creatinine in urine is considered to indicate clinical mercury poisoning. In 1997, an ad hoc expert group of the World Health Organization issued a so-called consensus statement on the safety of dental amalgam. This statement was later endorsed by the Fédération Dentaire Internationale, an international dental trade organization. 
Following an evaluation of a large amount of sometimes conflicting evidence from diverse sources, the WHO offers the following consensus statements on dental amalgam. Dental amalgam restorations are considered safe. From their website in 2004, the American Dental Association explicitly relies on this consensus statement to support their position on the safety of dental amalgam. From their website in 2004, the Australian Dental Association explicitly relies on this consensus statement to support their position on the safety of dental amalgam. Incidentally, in 2004 on their websites, the British and Canadian dental associations restrict this sensitive information to their members only. In 2004, the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, in their current position paper on dental amalgam, available from their website, also explicitly rely on the ad hoc expert group's consensus statement. In 1997, in this letter, the World Health Organization made the status of ad hoc expert groups abundantly clear. Expert groups, whatever the form, are usually set up as ad hoc groups, and what they have in common is that they are only set up in order to provide advice to the World Health Organization. This means that any statements or recommendations made by the group or the individual experts are not in any way binding for the World Health Organization, or for any other body for that matter, as they are only made as advice to the WHO. The World Health Organization is in no way responsible for the advice provided to it by the experts. In 2003, the World Health Organization issued its current official position statement on the safety of dental amalgam. Elemental mercury and inorganic mercury compounds, human health aspect number 50. Dental amalgam constitutes a potentially significant source of exposure to elemental mercury, with estimates of daily intake from amalgam restorations ranging from 1 to 27 micrograms per day. The majority of dental amalgam holders being less than 5 micrograms per day. Even one avoidable microgram of mercury is too much, as we shall soon see. For elemental mercury, the main route of exposure is by inhalation, and 80% of inhaled mercury is retained. Retained means it is stored in every cell of the body. Mercury may be absorbed through the skin in toxicologically relevant quantities. Elemental mercury is lipid-soluble and easily penetrates biological membranes, including the blood-brain barrier. This takes the mercury directly into the brain. Metabolism of mercury compounds to other forms of mercury can occur within tissues of the body. We are warned against eating fish precisely because they contain this form of mercury. A broad range of symptoms have been reported and these symptoms are qualitatively similar, irrespective of the mercury compound to which one is exposed. Mercury is mercury is mercury. Specific neurotoxic symptoms include tremors, emotional lability, insomnia, memory loss, neuromuscular changes, headaches, polyneuropathy, and performance deficits in tests of cognitive and motor function. Although improvement in most neurological dysfunctions has been observed upon removal of the person from the source of exposure, some changes may be irreversible. Mercury from dental amalgam can cause permanent brain damage. Acrodynia and photophobia have been reported in children exposed to excessive levels of metallic mercury vapour. Acrodynia is a classic form of mercury poisoning. It has multiple and sometimes fatal symptoms. It's characterised by abnormally pink skin, hence the name pink disease. Thousands of Australian children contracted pink disease in the 1940s and 50s from mercury added to infants' teething powders. 
Photophobia means extreme sensitivity to light. Mild clinical signs of central nervous system toxicity can be observed among people who have been exposed occupationally to elemental mercury concentrations of 20 micrograms per cubic metre or above for several years. Levels as high as 150 micrograms per cubic metre have been measured in mouths with amalgam fillings. This exposure is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for as long as the fillings remain in the mouth. Mercury leaches out of the set amalgam fillings all the time, but it comes out faster with any increase in temperature, like when you have a cup of hot tea. Friction, eating or grinding your teeth, also increases the rate of release of mercury. Once the rate of release is increased in this fashion, it remains elevated for about 90 minutes. Gold, in contact with amalgam, constitutes a short-circuited, permanent galvanic cell, where the electrolytes are constantly renewed. The worst effects occur with root fillings using gold-plated brass screws directly in contact with amalgam and gold caps or bridges over amalgams. In the mouth, gold acts as a cathode and the less noble metal, dental amalgam, functions as the anode and a dissolution of the less noble metal takes place. Till and Malley report finding 200 to 300 micrograms of mercury per gram of tissue in teeth with amalgam only. But 1,200 micrograms of mercury per gram of tissue in teeth with both amalgam and gold. The levels increased with time and did not come from food. If gold and amalgam are present in the same mouth, it may increase the release of mercury by up to fourfold from all of the filling. Amalgam fillings also act like capacitors. They store electric charge. These currents can be measured with a simple microammeter. The magnitudes of oral currents are in the same range as those induced in the tissues of a human standing directly under a high voltage transmission line. These oral currents operate in the range of microamps. Our central nervous system operates in the range of nanoamps. This means that if you have amalgam fillings, you have a device in your mouth which is storing an electrical charge that's 1,000 times greater than the delicate nervous system which surrounds it. Voltages in the mouth constitute a permanent stress on the autonomic nervous system. That's the part of the nervous system that regulates all of the unconscious functions of the body, such as digestion, breathing, and heart rate. The human body is a delicately balanced electromagnetic system. This is not something generally acknowledged by the quacks. Amalgam fillings respond to external electrical stimulation too. Electromagnetic field effects are so strong in the human body that one study found that simply sitting close to a cathode ray tube, like a TV set or computer monitor, significantly increased the mercury vapour release from all three types of amalgam studied. In 1990, three Canadian and American scientists published a brilliant study that for the first time indisputably showed that mercury from dental amalgam accumulates in every part of the body, with higher concentrations in some vital organs. The scientists radioactively labelled the mercury before they mixed it into an amalgam. Then they put the radioactively labelled amalgam into the teeth of five pregnant sheep. Whole body gamma scans graphically revealed the distribution of mercury throughout the sheep's bodies. There was only one place this radioactively labelled mercury could have come from, the amalgam fillings in the sheep's teeth. Mercury levels reached a peak in the amniotic fluid, maternal blood and fetal blood within 48 hours. Mercury was found in all tissues of the mother and the fetus. In the foetus, the highest levels were in the liver, the pituitary gland and in the developing brain. Mercury levels in the foetal blood were four times higher than maternal blood levels. High mercury levels were also found in the mother's breast milk. Despite being published in the American Journal of Physiology and widely peer-reviewed, the findings were disputed by the dental associations. 
Their most serious criticism was based on the notion that sheep chew more than people and were therefore not a good human model. Of course sheep were chosen for the study because they are such good chewers. The study was performed again on a more acceptable human model, one monkey. The researchers felt more than one was unethical under the circumstances. This time the research was published in the journal of FASEB, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. Their journal is one of the highest rated as a scientific source by the scientific community worldwide. The findings were the same. Distribution of mercury to every cell in the body. The next landmark study was conducted by Drash, the professor of forensic medicine at Munich University, who conducted autopsy studies on a number of prematurely deceased fetuses, infants and children. The study was conclusive. The amount of mercury in the bodies of the children was directly proportional to the number of amalgam fillings in their mother's mouths. In January 2003, the Superior Court of California ruled that dentists must display the following sign in their waiting rooms. Dental amalgam used in many dental fillings causes exposure to mercury, a chemical known to the state of California to cause birth defects and other reproductive harm. Root canal treatments and restorations, including fillings, crowns and bridges, use chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer. Eighty percent of all inhaled mercury vapour is absorbed through the lungs and transported via the blood to every cell of the body. The brain is the critical target organ for mercury vapour. Most of the mercury comes via the blood and crosses the protective blood-brain barrier. Some mercury vapour attaches to the lining of the nose and mouth and passes through the bones of the skull to go directly into the brain. In fact, the brain accumulates about 10 times more mercury after exposure to mercury vapour compared to injecting or swallowing the same amount of mercuric ions. In 1966, Telegina, a Russian scientist, injected water-soluble dyes into the jaw of a cadaver. The dye passed directly into the intracranial venous system, the veins around the brain. This clearly showed that toxins, including mercury, can easily pass from the teeth and their surrounding tissues through the veins to the brain. Mercury is also transported to the brain along the nerve fibres at a rate of about 10 millimetres per day. Mercury, which is mainly excreted via the liver, is also reabsorbed through the lining of the large intestine. It can recirculate and retoxify. In a common dental practice, amalgam is implanted into the bone to plug up the end of a root. The procedure is called a retrograde root filling. Even the manufacturer Cork has warned against this practice in its material safety data sheet. Many universities still teach this technique in 2004. Sometimes, amalgam is left in the bone by accident. Mercury is acutely hazardous as a vapour and in the form of its water-soluble salts which corrode membranes of the body. Microsoft and Carter. There is no evidence that mercury from amalgam causes a specific disease. Australian Dental Association newsletter, March 1995. That's right. Mercury from amalgam does not cause a specific disease. It causes mercury poisoning. And that's characterised by a very broad range of symptoms. Science. Systematic and formulated knowledge.
Over 1,400 published scientific references about the dangers of mercury from dental amalgam have been collated by one researcher alone. Almost 100 years ago in Germany, it was known that in women, there will be inflammations of the outer genitals, vaginal catars and disturbances of menstruation. That there is a tendency to miscarriage during chronic mercurialism is well known from the toxicology of mercury. Mercury is converted into methylmercury in the human body by normal gut and oral flora. A 1975 Swiss study suggested as many as 27% of the population were allergic to amalgam. In 1984, the US EPA stated, women chronically exposed to mercury vapour experience increased frequencies of menstrual disturbances and spontaneous abortions. A high mortality rate was observed among infants born to women with symptoms of mercury poisoning. Mercury can bind to the oxygen-carrying site on haemoglobin and restrict oxygen transport. This can cause a 50% reduction in the oxygenation of red blood cells. Mercury causes damage and weakening of blood vessel walls, which results in damage to the affected tissues. Patients with oral lichen adjacent to amalgam fillings become free of oral symptoms after the removal of amalgam fillings. Systemic conditions such as fibromyalgia and arthralgia improve markedly. Reduced immune function, autoimmune diseases, increased allergies and sensitivities. Motor neurone disease has been associated with mercury poisoning. Amalgam-bearing subjects had significantly higher blood pressure, lower heart rate, lower haemoglobin and lower hematocrit, chest pains, tachycardia, anemia, fatigue, tiring easily and being tired in the morning. The data suggest that inorganic mercury poisoning from dental amalgam does affect the cardiovascular system. Kidney filtration function in sheep is reduced by 60% within two weeks of amalgam placement. Symptoms of multiple sclerosis have improved after removal of amalgam fillings. Mercury released from dental amalgam fillings provokes an increase in mercury-resistant and antibiotic-resistant bacteria in oral and intestinal floras of primates. Recovery from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis after removal of dental amalgam fillings. Mercury from silver dental fillings may be a causal factor in multiple sclerosis. Dental amalgam fillings are the most important source of mercury exposure in the general population. Heavy metal exposure from dental amalgam may contribute to immunological aberrations which could lead to overt autoimmunity. Small amounts of mercury from amalgam can cause changes in the brain that are identical to those observed in Alzheimer's disease patients. Exposure to mercury vapour in utero results in the accumulation of mercury in the cerebellum, hippocampus and other regions of the nervous system associated with motor function and learning. Prenatal exposure to mercury causes alterations to both spontaneous and learned behaviours. Male infertility and lung problems are associated with mercury exposure. Thymus gland atrophy and renal autoimmune disease. 69% of patients with oral lichen had a complete regression after amalgam removal. Low concentrations of mercury can cause mutations, including single-strand breaks in the DNA. Many studies have implicated mercury in disorders of the central and peripheral nervous systems. Development at age seven years is delayed in children born to women exposed to methylmercury in their diet during pregnancy. The effects on brain function associated with prenatal methylmercury exposure therefore appear widespread and early dysfunction is detectable at exposure levels currently considered safe. 
this paper is so significant that the editor of The Lancet wrote a special editorial. The studies provide convincing new evidence of adverse behavioural effects associated with low-level mercury exposures within the range of that received by the general population. Neurological effects, fine motor function is affected. Over a two-year period in over 40 different cultures, it was found that an average of 77% nerve growth cones were affected by exposure to mercury ions. When neurons were exposed to the heavy metals aluminium, lead, cadmium and manganese, there was no observed degeneration of the growth cones. Seven of the characteristic markers that we look for to distinguish Alzheimer's disease can be produced in normal brain tissues or cultures of neurons by the addition of extremely low levels of mercury. Research has shown that Alzheimer's disease patients have at least three times higher blood levels of mercury than controls. How much more research is necessary before the appropriate regulatory bodies respond with restrictions on the use of mercury-leaking dental amalgam fillings? Mercury levels in a fetus's umbilical cord blood are 70% higher than those in the mother's blood. The EPA analysis is showing that even if the mother is below the danger zone, she can give birth to a baby that's over the limit. Micromercurialism induced by a continuous supply of minute doses of mercury being released from dental amalgam fillings is predominantly characterised by mental symptoms. Fatigue, physical and mental, lack of initiative, loss of short-term memory, lack of concentration, poor to no decision-making ability, irrational obsession, compulsions, timidity and lack of self-confidence, grave depression, rapid mood changes, sudden anger, unexplainable fear of death, hallucinations, shyness and timidity, tendency to isolation, suicidal, Mercury poisoning is implicated in such a wide variety of conditions that it would be impossible and irresponsible to list them here. Recognising the symptoms in yourself does not mean that you have mercury poisoning. However, if you have amalgam in your mouth, you have mercury going into your body. If amalgam is so dangerous, why aren't all the dentists sick? In 2004, the majority of dental schools and professional dental associations are still assuring their students and members that dental amalgam is safe. So dentists, in good conscience, will expose themselves, their staff and their patients to levels of mercury vapour in their dental surgeries that would cause a factory to be shut down. Dentists are regularly exposed to between 50 and 4,000 micrograms of mercury per cubic metre in the course of their working day. This constitutes a hazardous working environment with serious and even tragic implications. A huge study of 9,241 dentists and dental personnel revealed twice as many glioblastomas, that's a form of brain cancer, as was found in the general population. Female dental personnel have roughly twice the rate of other women of infertility, miscarriage, birth defect, stillbirths and disturbed menstruation. Dentists score poorly in the areas of complex attention, psychomotor tasks and mental health. They show reduced concentration emotional instability and their fine motor function is seriously affected. Some motor tremor, 90%. Some psychomotor dysfunction, 41%. Severe psychomotor dysfunction, 16%. Impaired immediate recall, 58%. Impaired auditory memory, 84%. Visual memory reduced, 52%. Vigilance, attention, concentration and cognitive comprehension, 52%. Work and lives felt to be pointless, 36%. Tactile sensory dysfunction, inability to locate finger position, 52%. Logical thinking and story recall impaired, 79%. Spatial and visual memory impaired, 68%. History of unsatisfying interpersonal relationships, 27%. 
Out of normal range, on emotional stability scale, 72%. Suicidal depression, disgust with life, despondency and despair, 27%. Increased state of agitation, 30%. Increased scores on psychopathic scale, 42%. These are all symptoms of mercury poisoning. The study concludes that after five years in the profession, dentists' IQ levels drop about one standard deviation below the rest of the population. This is an enormous and significant drop. In the Superior Court of the State of California, case number 718228, Demurra, October 22, 1992, the American Dental Association presented the following legal defence. The American Dental Association owes no legal duty of care to protect the public from allegedly dangerous products used by dentists. The ADA did not manufacture, design, supply or install the mercury-containing amalgams. The ADA does not control those who do. The ADA's only alleged involvement in the product was to provide information regarding its use. Dissemination of information relating to the practice of dentistry does not create a duty of care to protect the public from potential injury. The Australian Dental Association have suggested that the most accurate method to assess body mercury burden is to measure the mercury concentration of urine or blood. The normal range of mercury in these fluids is well established, they say. The thing that is well established is that there's very little mercury in the urine or blood because it's bound up to the cell. Elemental mercury is absorbed from the blood into other tissue compartments. Tissue levels can be really high where blood and urine levels are extremely low. The DMPS challenge test uses a collating agent to remove some of the mercury from some of the cells and dump it in the urine. This gives a reasonable indication of the body burden of mercury and it is always orders of magnitude higher than a standard blood or urine test. A linear relationship exists between the number of amalgams and tissue levels of mercury. Amalgam removal has been shown to be effective in reducing mercury levels to the levels of those in people without amalgam fillings. What you are seeing is the typical method of removing an amalgam filling as performed in dental surgeries throughout the world and as still taught in universities today. Cutting an amalgam filling immediately produces very high levels of mercury vapour in the mouth. Measurements 18 inches from the mouth in this procedure reveal levels of mercury vapour of 4,000 micrograms per cubic metre. Cutting an amalgam filling also produces a vast cloud of microscopic amalgam particles. These particles are easily inhaled all the way to the alveoli of the lungs, the final interface between the environment, air and your blood. The longer the drill is touching the filling, the more mercury vapour and particles are being released. Most dental schools teach this as the way to remove dental amalgam. If you open your eyes during this procedure, you'll most likely see the dentist and dental nurse wearing a paper mask or no mask at all. What most dental personnel don't realise is that a paper mask offers minimal protection. Mercury vapour passes through the mask and microscopic particles adhere to the mask. The temperature of the breath vaporises the mercury in these particles and concentrates the mercury vapour inside the mask more highly than in the surrounding air. 
In this sort of procedure, all relevant safety levels are exceeded at least 1,000 fold. There is a safer way to do this. The use of a rubber dam is a basic minimum to protect the patient's airways. You really need three of these. Separate air supplies for the patient, dentist and nurse, which blows the amalgam particles and the mercury vapour away from the face. To minimise the amount of cutting time, special drill bits should be used which shatter rather than grind the amalgam. A continuous stream of water must be played onto the drill bit to keep it cool. High volume suction held close to the drill bit also reduces the number of amalgam particles and the amount of mercury vapour in the mouth and in the air around. You need to be certain that the exhaust from the surgery suction system is vented to outside the building, not into the surgery itself, or the whole surgery within seconds becomes a fume cupboard with high levels of mercury vapour. Mercury vapour passes directly through most suction filters. All amalgam must be removed, from under crowns, at the ends of roots, and from implants in the bone or soft tissue. Not a single speck must remain. Removal of amalgam is only one, and not even the first step, in removing the mercury from the body. Even with the best care, you will still be exposed to some mercury vapour, as will the dental personnel. Careful preparation with special supplements enables the body to excrete the mercury from this source, and that which is released from the cells into the bloodstream during the process. There are lots of different thoughts about how best to detoxify your body once the source of the mercury has been removed. A range of supplements and procedures may be employed. Choose a healthcare practitioner who is aware of mercury toxicity to guide you through this process. This is just as important as removing the amalgam from your mouth in the first place. The Canadian Dental Association, in their position paper on amalgam from 1995, ask, is dental amalgam approved for use in Canada? They reply, yes, dental amalgam is approved for use in Canada by Health Protection Branch. Responding to the CDA in a letter dated February 27, 1996, Health Canada wrote, This statement is categorically false. Dental amalgam has never undergone pre-market review in Canada because it was in use before the medical devices regulations were established. The CDA previously published this misinformation in a paper in the CDA Journal in May 1995. At that time, we informed the CDA of this error, but the CDA has repeated it here. Dental amalgam has never been registered as a filling with the TGA in Australia or the FDA in the United States, as it is classified as a dental device which is fabricated outside of the mouth. ADA advice to dental practitioners. The Australian Dental Association states that dental amalgam is a safe, cost-effective material. No grounds exist for recommending discontinuance due to toxicity. The ADA policy remains on the basis of research available that the use of dental amalgam causes no harmful effects. Dental amalgam is still the most favoured material for repairing decay in most premolar and molar teeth. <coughs> Professor Dwyer pointed out that in order to believe the claims relating to toxicity of dental amalgam raised by the alternative health lobby, one would have to believe in a conspiracy involving the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and the Medical Research Councils in Australia, Canada, the USA and Sweden, all working in concert to hide from the public a dreadful toxicity which exists with amalgam. With reference to the fact that mercury is a multipotent toxin with effects on several levels of the biochemical dynamics of the cell, Amalgam must be considered to be an unsuitable material for dental restorations. 
This is especially true since fully adequate and less toxic alternatives are available. The safety margin it was thought existed with respect to mercury exposure from dental amalgam has been erased. The no observable effects level is the lowest concentration of a substance in the environment that does not cause any observable effects in the human body. According to the World Health Organization, the Noel for mercury is zero. This means that exposure to any level of mercury, no matter how minute the quantity, constitutes a serious and avoidable risk to human health. There is no level of mercury in a room or a mouth that can be considered safe. That first filling is a critical step in the life of a tooth. Using amalgam for the first filling requires removing a lot of the tooth substance. Not only diseased tooth substance, but healthy tooth substance as well. So in making the undercut, you sacrifice a lot and this results in a weakened tooth. The next thing you know, the tooth breaks off and you need a crown. Then you need to repair the crown and so it continues to the stage where there is no more to repair and you pull the tooth. With the first filling, you should do something that can either restore the tooth or retain more healthy tooth substance. Use new materials, composites or materials you can bond to the surface without undercuts. You can do this with little removal of the tooth substance so that the core of the tooth is still there. Using amalgam is the wrong thing to do, clinically, technically and dentally. Amalgam should never be used as a restorative material in paediatric dentistry. Why? Because better alternatives are available. Amalgam should never be used as a first-time restorative material. Why? Because better alternatives are available. Move over amalgam at last. Some of the benefits of using non-amalgam material. Minimal toxicity compared to amalgam. Minimal tooth removal. Bonds and seals to all surfaces of the tooth enamel and dentine. Strengthens the tooth by becoming an integral bonded part. No need for pins. Can be used safely under a metal crown. Does not generate electrical interference. Easily worked by the experienced dentist. Sets hard in 20 seconds. Long wearing often beyond 10 years. Tooth coloured. Looks great. These materials are not regarded as toxic waste anywhere. They do not release mercury. Better alternatives to dental amalgam are readily available. Removal of dental amalgam is hazardous. Strict protocols must be applied for the safety of the patient and the dental personnel. Mercury is the third most toxic substance known to science. Mercury is released continuously from dental amalgam fillings for the life of the fillings. Mercury damages blood vessel walls. Mercury causes infertility, miscarriage, birth defects, stillbirths, disturbed menstruation, learning deficits in children. Mercury toxicity symptoms mimic a number of degenerative and autoimmune diseases. Mercury has a no observable effects level of zero, 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 zero.